Hey folks, this is Kalani. Patch 10.2 is chugging along quite nicely on the PTR and the larger parts of the update are starting to take shape. In this week's build we have another round of class changes, including some large buffs, a handful of nerfs and some tier set bonuses are already seeing big changes as well. We also have our first look at the new open world events coming in the 10.2 zone. Gearing up might be a bit harder at the start of the patch thanks to a larger bump in item level. Raid testing has started and we have a whole schedule planned out and we might also even see some more dragon riding cup events for the old world. There's a lot to talk about so let's break it all down. Now before we jump in be sure to hit up that like button and subscribe so you never miss another video. Let's kick things off with the class changes for this week. We don't have quite as many as last week, which shouldn't be too surprising. We had a crazy number of changes last week, so it shouldn't take too long to go through. To start with, the Druids have a couple of changes. Heart of the Wild will now additionally reduce the cast time of Balance spells by 30%, but the damage boost was knocked down to 20% for both Balance and Cat form abilities. Flourish had its cooldown reduced to 60 seconds to try and offset the large nerfs that came through last week. Fire Mages have a quick fix for their new 4 set bonus coming in the next raid. Monks have a little nerf to their 2 set for Mist Weaver by the looks of things, renewing Mist Jumps will no longer count. Paladins also have a quick change to their set bonus, Divine Toll is now guaranteed to target at least one valid enemy and there are some bug fixes thrown in for good measure. Priests have a nice bump for their heal, increased by 40% for the Holy Priests, and then Shadow Priest has a few fixes for Death Speaker and for the new set bonuses. And then Rogues have quite a few changes this week, not too surprising considering they're the main target for big changes this patch. Night Stalker damage bonus was reduced down to 5 and 10%, and Elusiveness was doubled up to reduce your damage taken by 20% instead of 10%. For Assassination, Venom Rush's energy return was reduced down to 5, King's Bane damage was reduced by 10%, Internal Bleeding was knocked down by 20%, Exsanguinate has changed yet again, and Elaborate Planning has been removed entirely. But Outlaw, Marked for Death no longer benefits from the cooldown reduction effect of Restless Blades, and then for Subtlety, Secret Technique Shadow Clone attacks won't be able to double dip from various bonuses, Gormor's Bite damage was increased by 20%, Shuriken Storm's energy cost was increased, and Gormite's Bite now correctly consumes Cold Blood. Shamans will see some buffs for their single target heals, for Resto, Riptide is getting a 30% buff and Unleash Life is getting a 40% buff, so that will definitely help with the other nerfs that most healers are going to see in 10.2. Demonology Warlocks are the only ones with changes this week for our favourite demonic spell slingers. Imp Gang Boss is getting redesigned, so whenever you summon wild imps there will be a chance for that imp to be a boss, which deals extra damage. And then we wrap things up with the Warriors. It looks like they're changing various effects that were eating up your bleeds instantly and changing them to just increase the rate of damage from your bleeds instead. Apparently that was causing quite a few problems with the rotation. They're also removing Ignore Pain from various rage spending mechanics to make Ignore Pain a defensive only option. Do note that these changes are for arms so it shouldn't affect the other specs. That's all for the class changes this week. I imagine we will see many more over the coming weeks as these changes get a lot of testing and iteration. Folks are probably still tinkering around with the initial burst of class changes. We did have a lot to go through last week. So the next week or so might be a bit slow, but these class changes usually start to ramp up the closer we get to the patch's release date. For 10.2, that's looking to be very late October or very early November, so pretty much just before or just after BlizzCon. That's where most folks are putting their money. We'll have to wait and see how the dev team want to play this one though. All of these changes are of course for patch 10.2, which means you won't see any of them on live servers just yet, and if you want to test them out, you'll need to hop onto the PTR. This PTR build also gave us our first look at the new trio of events that make up a good chunk of the new outdoor world content coming in the new patch. The three events feed into each other and it always starts with the Super Bloom event. You'll need to follow around this ancient, protect it and collect things as you go. The more you kill and collect, the better the bloom will be. There's a bar at the top of the screen that tracks your progress just like with time rifts, so it's another big group event. Hopefully this one won't lag quite as bad as 
some of the other public events we've had so far. Lag always kills the fun with this kind of thing. You want a lot of people to be there, but then that kind of makes it so you can't play. The event seems to end with a rare spawn, but it is a little finicky right now, and probably isn't all there, or just not a full event. I imagine the events will get polished up as future PTR builds are released. After the Super Bloom event ends, the Emerald Frenzy will begin. This literally seems to be a kill as many mobs as you can kind of event, which is pretty fun. Hopefully the dev team doesn't mess up the tagging rules on these monsters, because you are going to have a lot of players all in one spot trying to hit everything they can. If normal tagging rules apply, that's just going to end up being a lot of greyed out nameplates for most players. So open tagging should be enabled here to make sure everyone can take part and actually benefit from the event. Mobs drop a few different things. The dew drops seem to be the main currency you'll be wanting from this event, but they can also drop dream fragments too, which you can combine into extra rewards. After the frenzy is over, you'll probably have some seeds and a whole bunch of this dew drop currency. You can plant seeds in soil patches found around the zone, and then you can use the dew drops to nurture the plant. The more you put into the plant, the better the reward is going to be. After filling up the bar and waiting for the timer to expire, I got a variety of profession materials, a new material called seed blooms, as well as a new profession recipe, so maybe this event is focused more on materials instead of gear rewards. This will probably be cheaper and faster with more people involved, and you can probably plant more seeds so you can do the event over and over again, or at least until you run out of seeds to plant or soil patches to plant in. The rewards for this stuff definitely isn't final, but I did pick up some pieces of gear as part of the events too, including a piece of veteran gear at item level 444, which was a reward from the end of the super bloom part of the event. So there are potentially some good gearing up opportunities here for solo content players as well. I really like how these events play into each other, and there's a good variety of what you can do or what you need to do to progress in each event. We won't get a good idea of how lucrative these events will be until the rewards are finalised, which will probably be in a later PTR cycle, but for now they seem like fun additions to the game and fitting quite well with the Emerald Dream theme. They really need to figure out that whole lag thing though. Now gearing up in general is actually going to be a bit different in Season 3 by the looks of things, mainly because everything is increasing in item level, and I don't mean just increasing like it usually does. Obviously, a new season, new raid, new mythic plus dungeon rotation, all of that will drop higher item levels when compared to Season 2, but everything will be about 13 item levels higher when compared to the previous seasonal increases. The easiest way to visualise and look at this is by looking at raid difficulties and what gear they drop. So for the Season 1 to Season 2 transition, Season 1 Mythic Raid Gear was the same item level as Season 2 Normal Raid Gear, so we didn't see that much of an increase, right? Anyone who was doing Mythic Raiding in Season 1 could almost go straight into Heroic for Season 2. They already had the equivalent of full Normal Raid Gear in the new season. Well, for the Season 2 to Season 3 transition, that's going to be one step lower, so the Mythic Raiding Gear from Season 2 will actually be the same item level as the Raid Finder Gear from Season 3, so we're getting a big reset this time. I'm not sure if they just want to up power levels or make sure there's a larger gap so that they can reward better gear in lower tiers of content like the open world content and these new events, or maybe because of the upgrade system. Being able to upgrade everything kind of makes it easier for you to get higher item levels compared to the content you're running. It's pretty easy to get up to item level 437 right now, even for players who don't raid or do Mythic Plus dungeons. So to make sure everything ends up being rewarding in the new patch, the new stuff needs to reward much higher item levels. I don't know if that's the specific reason, but that does make sense to me. Typically content is also balanced roughly around the item levels that it rewards, so I would expect everything to be a bit harder at the start of Season 3 until you start gearing up in the new season. All of this should also carry over to PvP and Mythic Plus, so overall item levels will be about 13 higher than they were in Season 2 for comparable content, which means we're starting a bit further behind when Season 3 starts. Just an interesting little change I thought you might want to know about. While we're on the topic of item levels and Season 3 rewards, we already have a full, or what looks to be a full, schedule for 10.2 PTR raid testing. The patch hasn't been up on the PTR that long, but the dev team seem very keen to get this raid tested as quickly as possible, and to get the schedule out there ahead of time so everyone knows what to expect. 
Testing started on Thursday, September 14th, and it looks like Heroic will all be squared away in just two weeks of testing, and then Normal opens up over the weekend right after that. Then it's straight into Mythic testing, with Raid Finder Wings right afterwards. It's every Thursday and Friday for the next month or so, ending on October 13th. So, assuming nothing goes wrong, Raid testing will actually be concluded quite a bit before the end of October, which is when a lot of folks are expecting the patch to release. It's either October 31st or November 7th at this point, I think, so raid testing should be done with plenty of time left over. The patch as a whole seems to be quite far along, with most quest lines, events, and other content types ready to test, so it's really just like patch 10.1. That one hit PTR as almost a complete patch, so I think 10.2 should release in a pretty good state as well. If you're interested in helping test the raids, they usually start at 1pm PST on Thursday or Friday, and you'll need to get set up on the PTR realm. Moving on, there's another kind of endgame progression you may be interested in, a new Pathfinder achievement. This one is special though, it doesn't unlock the ability to fly in the new zone like most Pathfinders did. We can drag and ride through the Emerald Dream Zone right from the get-go, just like Patch 10.1 and the Zeralek Cavern. This new Pathfinder achievement unlocks the ability to use old flying in Dragonflight. So you can use all of your old flying mounts and use the standard style of flying, which means you don't necessarily have have to drag and ride in the Dragon Isles past this patch. The achievement seems pretty simple overall, it just asks you to complete a bunch of story and exploration content, including the story quests for the four original Dragon Isle zones, the Zaralek Cavern quest lines, this one here, Fresh Scales 15, asks you to get Renown 15 with every faction, so that one will take a while if you haven't started on that yet, and then you need to explore the Dragon Isles, Zaralek Cavern, and the Emerald Dream Zone. So there's actually not that much new content in here, just exploring the new area and earning Renown 15 with the new faction. That's what will take the most time here, but the rest of it you can start working on before the patch goes live, which is definitely nice. But if you do get this achievement done in 10.2, you'll be allowed to use old style flying in the Dragon Isles, just in case you don't really like or enjoy dragon riding anymore. And then the last little update we have for this week gives us a look at what could be more dragon riding cup events. On the PTR, we have calendar events for four new cups. Outland Cup, Northrend Cup, Pandaria Cup, and Broken Isles Cup. So they aren't going through expansion to expansion in order. Some are getting skipped over, but this would cover most of the major continents you see on the world map right now. The only two missing ones would be the BFA zones, I think. And then, of course, anything else that's separated from here, like the Shadowlands. But at least we have Outland included in this new round of cups. If you're curious, it looks like the events are currently scheduled every three months or so. Outland Cup is on the calendar for January, Northrend is there in April, and so on. We have no idea if that schedule is accurate and will actually stay there when the patch goes live. I would bear in mind that we will probably see Dragon Riding become available in the old world just freely at some point either during or after the Dragonflight expansion. We are fully expecting to head into a new expansion at the end of 2024, unless the dev team wants to pull a big switcheroo on us, so any cup events past that point might not make sense anyway. We'll just have to wait and see how that all comes to a head. I'm sure we're going to get quite a few answers at BlizzCon in early November. But that's all of the updates we have for this week, so that's it for this video. Which classes do you think need the most attention as we look towards Season 3 of Dragonflight? Will you use the old style of flying in the Dragon Isles, or do you think dragon riding is just way more fun? Leave all your thoughts in the comments section below. A big thank you to all of our supporters over on Patreon and to all of our members here on YouTube. You can see the names floating by on screen. If you'd like to add your name to the end of every video with a special shout out at the start of the next video, you can find links in the description over to Patreon or click the join button just below this video. And if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you never miss another video. Thanks for watching folks, good luck and have fun, and as always I will see you next time.